Now, my sermon tonight is a little bit of a different type of a sermon than I've ever preached before. This is actually the third part of a series that I've been doing on Sunday nights. And I'll just give you a little bit because most people here haven't been here for the other ones. Um, what I'm doing is I'm going to be comparing the culture of 1950s America with today. So we're going to be looking at some aspects of the way things were in the 1950s and why they were right according to Scripture. Why that, that mentality and that attitude. Now, there's going to be a little bit of generalization here. Okay, this doesn't apply to everybody. It's a little broad brush. But what I've done was I found this website, you know, a month ago or whenever, where people actually give, it was kind of a nostalgic website. And it's people just giving personal testimony to 1950s. It has nothing to do with religion. It has nothing to do with their take on society in general. It was just a view of people giving their thoughts on a time period that they grew up in. Now, I've heard a lot about the 50s. Obviously, I was, I'm not old enough to have gone through that time period. And everything that I've heard from it, though, all the accounts that, that I'm going to be quoting tonight reflect everything else that I've heard and that you've heard. You know, even on TV and in the media, you kind of get a general picture for what the 50s were like. And for the most part, it's pretty accurate from everything that I've heard and from people I've talked to, they were alive during that area, that it was a much safer time period. And there's a lot of other, you know, the, the, the morality was much higher in this country at that point. There's so many things that were different. So what we're going to do is I've already gone in sermons past. I preached on the differences in the, the, the cultural perception of gender roles of how a woman's role and a man's role in the 1950s in this country, in America, is va was vastly different than it is today. There's been a lot of progress right, in that area and up to this point. But I preached that already. I'm not going to go into that today. I've also preached on the difference in the entertainment. So the movies, the music, these other things, you know, things that people do to entertain themselves and what they consisted of, what was considered pure, what was considered, you know, weird to have on the TV publicly displayed. Okay, that was last week. This week now, there's kind of the broad, the broad subject is just, I kind of call it family values because there's a few other things that just don't quite fit anywhere, but I wanted to include in a sermon. So it's a little bit different. Normally my sermons are completely just starting from the Bible and preaching through what it means. A little bit different, but a lot of Bible, still a lot of Scripture, because what we're going to be doing is pointing to the positive aspects of that culture and why it was biblically accurate. So I, I'm going to start off now reading for you a quote. Now this first section is going to deal with children and having children in the 50s. This is a quote that, that some anonymous person, I don't know who it was, wrote, and I'll just read it for you. It, says, it was not expected that parents would limit the size of their families with any reliable birth control, and it was not expected that any teenagers would have access to reliable birth control. So this is, this is just a statement that someone made, right? It's a factual statement. It has nothing to do with their motivation. So most of these quotes you'll notice as we read through it, there's not like a motive for this, right? It has nothing to do in their minds with religion. They're just stating this is the way things were. And we're going to look at this, and that's why we start off with Psalm 127, because the mindset at that time was the families were not so concerned in just thinking, how are we going to limit our families? We can only have two children, a boy and a girl, and that's it, and no more children after that. And this is the way that this society has gone into thinking that Families should only have two children, one child or two children. You wouldn't want to overpopulate this place and go crazy with the kids and you need to use these contraptions and all this other stuff. And there has been other factors that have gone into changing this as well as far as um, economically. Times have become more trying and, and now we're in a world where, where men and women are both going sent off to work and, and trying to provide for their family. And there's been a lot of reasons why people are scaling back on having children. But according to the Bible, as we see here in Psalm 127, verse number 3, Lo, children are an heritage of the Lord, and the fruit of the womb is His reward. Having children is a very good thing. It's a reward. It's a blessing. This is the mindset that we need to get back to. This is the mindset that was correct in, the, in America in the 1950s. 
Today, people think you're nuts. Even our family, I mean, we go out, we have four children. It is not some huge family. But even these days, it's enough to turn heads. Whoa, whoa. You ever going to stop? It's like, we only have four. I mean, we don't have a dozen kids. We don't have 20 kids, which that is a lot. But I mean, hey, the Bible says, Happy is the man, look at verse number five. Happy is the man that hath his quiver full of them. It's, it's, it's likening children to arrows, right? A quiver. So you, as much as you want to have as a warrior, you want to have your quiver full of arrows, man. You don't want to run out of those arrows to be shooting at the enemy. He said, hey, you're happy if your quiver is full of children. That's what this is referring to. If you have a lot of children, happy is the man that hath his quiver full of them. They shall not be ashamed, but they shall speak with the enemies in the gain. It's a good thing. It's a very positive. You will never find ever anywhere in Scripture telling you to limit how many children you have. It is always referred to as a blessing. You look at the blessing of Rachel when she left her country. They said they, her blessing to her was that she would be the mother of thousands of millions. That's a lot of kids. <laughs> now, obviously, they're referring to her descendants and stuff, too, but that was a great blessing. They couldn't bless her with anything greater when she's leaving than we just hope that you have a lot of children and a huge family and that God blesses you with children. That is the, the scriptural stand on how many children should we have? Should we get involved with, with these weird devices of birth control and, and preventing ourselves from having children? And... According to this statement, people were never thinking about limiting. I mean, okay, are you going to show me some examples of people who limit their family? I'm sure you could find them. It's a broad brush. The generalization, the, the general view of the culture was just that there's no reason to, to limit the family. The family was great. The family was the most important thing, essentially, in life. I mean, obviously God, but like, you know, the family was critical to, su to succeed to success. And that was success in the eyes of someone living in the 50s was, hey, we're going to have our family, we're going to live together, we're going to have our you know, nice house or whatever, but like, it was all revolving around the family and the structure of the family was, was critical. I'll continue on reading this quote. It says, it was expected that you would have at least two children. Only children were looked on as something of an oddity and the phrase only child was spoken in a lowered voice. So the way that people look at us today for having four kids, it was the exact opposite. They would look at someone like, oh, they only have one kid. That's an only child. As if that was kind of a weird thing. Now, okay, if God only blesses you with one child, praise God for that. There are people that they don't try to, to do all these weird birth control techniques and everything else. That's just what they've been given. And God's the one that blesses us with children. The point being here, though, is that children nowadays are looked on as a burden. They're looked on as, oh man, another rug rat or another mouth to feed or whatever. And what a horrible view to have of children. No. Right. No. I, love our, I love my children. I mean, I hope we have a whole bunch more because they're awesome. They're great. Is it a lot of work? You bet it is a lot of work. Does it involve sacrifices? Yes. Do I have to work my hands to the bone? Of course I do. But it's so worth it to see these little lives and to bring them into the world and, and to have the joy that comes with having children. Praise God for it. That's the way that they need to be looked upon, not as a burden. And I pray for the family that looks on their kids as a burden. Too bad if you might have to do without some financial things. Oh well, is your life just about the things that you have? I mean, honestly, I'm very comfortable with where we're at, but we're by no means rich. I mean, I thank God we've got a nice house and we've got a ve two vehicles. I mean, it, we are literally rich. In, in today's society, though, people have this backwards idea of thinking that like, oh man, it's just so, you know, I'm so poor. When you really stop to look around at what you have and be appreciative of it, we don't have to have any of that stuff. We could be living in, a, in an apartment and still be happy. We ought to be happy. 
You know, with the whole family, as long as we have the whole family together, if that's all that I'm able to, to do and provide and that's all that God has given me with, then praise God for it. But I'm not going to start limiting the children that I have when they're a blessing from God. I want more blessing from God. <laughs> it's a good thing to have. Let's, I'll keep reading here now in uh, another quote. It says, Those today who were children in the American 50s often remark on how their parents seem to raise them with a kind of benign neglect. School-aged children were expected to play outdoors in their non-school hours. A mom didn't want them underfoot or lollygagging in their bedrooms. Most today report that their neighborhoods were thought to be 100% safe for unsupervised children. That there might be kidnappers and pedophiles lurking around every corner was not even part of the mental equation never even crossed their mind that these perverts would be just so prevalent that I can't leave my child unattended for a few hours in the daytime while they're out playing. What a sick, sad, depraved world that we live in today. Because, I mean, we just had this... I, I'm <coughs> The world we live in today, we set up a little tent in our backyard. In my back, my fenced-in backyard... And I was like, I don't want the kids out there alone. And we live in a safe community overall. I would say Prescott Valley is a, is a pretty low crime rate. But you hear about the stinking perverts and these pedophiles, and it's getting worse and worse and worse. And God forbid that one of them would come in to my backyard and defile one of my children. And it's to the point now where like, we can't even think about that. You know, that it has to, you have to think about it. You have, it happens too much to not think about that and to not be concerned for their safety. But the reason why is this. In Proverbs chapter 1, you turn if you like, you're in Psalms, just, just flip over a few pages, literally, where you're at the end of Psalms. Turn over to Proverbs chapter 1, verse number 32. Proverbs 1, 32. For the turning away of the simple shall slay them, and the prosperity of fools shall destroy them. But whoso hearkeneth unto me shall dwell safely and shall be quiet from fear of evil. See, the problem is that our society, our culture has turned away from God. Because if we were hearkening unto wisdom, if we were hearkening unto God, we would be able to dwell safely and be quiet from the fear of evil. And as I've mentioned in previous sermons, as we're talking about the, the overall, the culture of the, of the American 50s, and by no means was it perfect. And, and again, I'll, I'll reiterate that that is not my stance, is that the 50s were just perfect and there was no problems and they was completely godly and holy and everything they did was righteous. No. Absolutely not. They had their share of problems, but we're highlighting some of the aspects that were good. But in general, one of the reasons why they were able to enjoy the safety of fear from evil because by and large there was a lot more God-fearing people. The God of the Bible, the Lord Jesus Christ, was a common place thing in, in the homes of the, of the people that lived at that time. Learning about Jesus, reading the Bible were parts of, the, even if people were unsaved in their family, they still had reverence and respect for the Bible and the good book and the rules and the morals that were taught through the Bible. And when you have a culture that can embrace what God's Word says and the morality of it, you will be able to find yourself living in a, in a time where you're free from the fear of that type of an evil. Things are a long way from what they used to be in such a short period of time. I mean, in the 1950s, it was 60 years ago. People in this room were alive during that time period today. It's not, it's not just completely gone from our you know, memory collectively. Proverbs 12, look at Proverbs 12, verse number 8. Proverbs 12, 8 reads, The wicked walk on every side when the vilest men are exalted. Look at our society today. Look at the people who are lifted up, who are exalted. Who are, who, are, who are put in a place of just saying, hey, this is someone to look up to. Who do the kids look up to these days? Who are the posters of? It's the sick perverts in the, in the music and entertainment industry and these, these rock stars, these Lady Gagas and these people. I don't even know who half of these people are anymore, like, thankfully. But 
I see the images of them. You, you, can't, you can't get away from them, some, especially online. You know, these, these whores and whoremongers of Hollywood and the music industry that are being put up for display as this is cool. This is what you should be looking up to. The kids, I see little, I see kids in like grammar school dressing like hookers, these little girls, because they see this is what the rock stars do. They have almost no clothing. They have these super little mini skirts that barely cover their rear end. They have these, these low cut halter tops and they don't even have anything to show because they're so young, yet they're, they're getting trained into thinking that this is what they need to look like. Because the society has been way over sexualized, it's been turned into something that's just completely perverted and exalted. Instead of exalting a woman who's extremely modest, who's meek and quiet and has a humble spirit and is a hard worker and, and, and takes care of her family as being, this is a good example. This is what you should be striving for. It's the whores and whoremongers of Hollywood. This is, that's who the posters are. That's who people are being taught to look up to. And when the vilest are exalted, the wicked walk on every side. When that becomes what is promoted and exalted in this country, there's wicked people all over the place. That is why we cannot enjoy the safety that we ought to be able to enjoy. Continuing on here, another quote. Parents, the wisdom went, wanted children to develop a sense of independence and thus did not micromanage their children's playtime. There was the expectation then amongst parents that a child's playtime was desirably supposed to introduce kids to a number of disappointments. Injuries, bullying, and fracases, firming up their character for future adult life. This is the way that kids were treated. Like, look, we're not going to walk on eggshells around them and wrap them in bubble wrap and, and watch every single little thing that they do. They need to be able to go through life experiences at a young age instead of being coddled their whole life. Now, I don't have scripture to back this up, so just take my opinion for, <laughs> for a few minutes. But kids need to learn um, reality. For one, they need to learn consequences for their actions, right? And they need to be able to, to grow up and experience life, not just have some little device that they're going to have in front of their face all day and just learn how to communicate with people through shorthand text and never look up and actually be a part of society because that's where things are going these days. Sadly and unfortunately, everyone's glued to their little screens. And that goes for the kids as well as the adults. I still have a dumb phone. I don't need it. I don't want to get plugged into a virtual reality that, that that becomes my life. We have reality among us all the time. Make sure that, you're, that you don't get too involved in any of that stuff because all it is is a big waste of time. And people end up getting caught up in the sin and saying things and doing things that you would never end up doing in public. In the public space of the internet, people say things and gossip and, and all kinds of sin happens. All kinds of people get hurt as a result of, of a lot of the Facebook and other things that go on out there. And there's drama and this, none of it needs to even be there. But kids need to be able to get out. They need to learn these things. I'm going to re keep reading here a quote. Kids roamed free everywhere. And the rule in summer was be home by supper. I mean, even into the 80s, this was, this was similar to what was going on. In my childhood, that was, that was part of it. You know, when the street lights come on, it's time to go home. It's not like that today. If we were hanging about the house, we were urged to go outside. Parents and any others I knew did not at all care if you were on family property or three miles away. See, back then, they, I mean, just go outside and play. Doesn't mean you have to be in your front yard. You just... Go wherever, right? Go outside, play, explore, have fun. So long as you weren't misbehaving in ways that would be reported back, right? You're getting yourself in trouble and the neighbors spot him and say, hey, your boy's doing this. You better, you better do something about that. Or we're not bothering some adult. If you wanted to go to a sport practice or the like, you found a way or stayed after school until it began. Now, this is going into another concept that I have here. Uh, which is really important. This is actually more important than I think the person who's even writing this 
um, understand. It says, the idiot idea that a parent was a servant and driver for a child's whims and preferences was unthinkable. The family structure has been turned on its head these days for multiple reasons. Now, you have, for one, going back to general, just real briefly, you have women who are running the family instead of the man. God put the, the husband as the head of the household, as the one making the decisions, and the one that should be leading the family and, rule, yes, ruling the family. That's what the Bible says is that the husband is to be ruling and the wife is to be in subjection to the husband and the children are at the bottom of the authority structure. Unfortunately, these days, you have some women taking the leadership role and, and the men submitting. And then, in other cases, you have the children becoming the, the ones that are wagging the head. That they're the ones that are making the rules. And usually this happens in split homes. You have... The children now are able to dictate what they want the parent to do. And the parents now are just so focused on pleasing their children that they give up being a parent. They give up teaching what they ought to be teaching them and, and doing what's best for them. Because oftentimes what's best for kids is telling them no. No, you can't have that. No, you can't. No, you need to learn that you don't just get everything that you ask for. No, you need to learn that there's things that you need to work for. No, you need to understand that what mom and dad are doing are extremely important. Whether or not you understand it, it's for your benefit. There's going to be times when dad has to work. And he has to work until you're in bed already. So there may not be a time that dad's going to be able to drive you to go do something. And you're going to have to deal with it. There's going to be times when mom is too busy to do some of these things. Now, I'm not saying just completely ignore and neglect your kids. But the point is, we can't get turned up on our head of thinking that everything that the kid wants and needs and says that and needs. I say, I'm going to have to say need in quotes because we are doing, you are, you are as a parent supposed to be doing what the child needs. But the child doesn't need to always be going to sport practice. They don't need to always do the extracurriculars and the extra things and just to be there as their servant. Okay, Dad, now I want to go to this friend's house. Now I want to go do that. Now I want to do that. And just always giving in to, to them being the ones dictating. They need to learn to ask with respect and be able to, yeah, I mean, it doesn't mean you just always say no either. You still need to be able to, to provide what, you know, um, access to some things, but the idea of, of the, the dad or the husband being at the top and showing that proper respect is gone. Kids are speaking to their parents as if they're their buddy or their friend, as opposed to being their parent. There is a reverence and respect that needs to be paid from the wife to the husband, as well as from the kids to the husband and the kid to the mom. I do not stand for my children speaking to my wife as if they can just say whatever they want to her. Does not happen. Unacceptable in my family. They need to be give, showing her respect. The husband is the head of the household and shouldn't just be in title only. Everyone in the house is to be in subjection to him. This should be reflected in all areas. The wife was created by God to be in a help meet for her husband. Turn, if you would, to Ephesians 5, just real briefly, just to give you scripture on this. I don't like to be able to make in too many statements here without going to the Bible. Why is what I'm saying biblically true? Because Ephesians chapter 5 says in verse number, we'll start reading in verse 25, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also, oh, excuse me, let's jump up a little bit, verse 22. Verse 22, Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord, for the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. So just as much as we name Christ as the head of this church. He's the one that, is, that has the authority and the rule over our church. We give all authority unto him. He says, just as much as a church gives authority unto Christ, the wife needs to give the reverence and respect unto her husband. She needs to submit herself to her husband in the same way that the church submits itself to Christ. I didn't make that up. That's what Ephesians 5 says. 
Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. And then he goes on to the husbands. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. Obviously, there's two different roles there to be played. The husband needs to love his wife enough to be able to, hey, I'm going to give my life for you because I love you so much, and that is how much I value my wife. I'm willing to, to die for my wife. The love that Christ had for us. And on the flip side, the, 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 the role that God has given to the wife is to be in subjection. Let your husband lead. Let him be the head. Let him make the decisions. And then, of course, the children are, are subject unto both. In chapter 6 of Ephesians, the Bible says, Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor thy father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise, that it may be well with thee, and thou mayest live long on the earth. So the kids need to obey mom and dad. They have authority over nobody. Sometimes they think they have authority over their siblings. <laughs> they don't have authority over their siblings. They have themselves and to just look to mom and dad and to God as the ultimate authority in their life. And this is the structure. This is the way that the Bible is ordained. This is God, the way God wants the family to be. And we are so far removed from that. <clears throat> There's a lot of little things I believe that you can do in your house. And these little things ultimately don't matter. But when you're teaching and trying to keep a biblical household, I think we should look to the little things as well as the big things in how we handle things and how we communicate with each other in order to maintain this type of structure within the house. Now I know women might hear this preaching maybe online somewhere and be like, oh man, that male chauvinist, he's just saying all this stuff because he's a man. Look, I'm saying this stuff because it's written in the Bible. And people think that just men have it the best no matter what. No, I wish I was a man. No, no, you're, you're not getting the whole picture. Okay, men, have, men have a lot of responsibility in a very important role. It, it, it basically boils down to us to make sure that you are fed, that you are clothed, that you have everything that you need that responsibility falls on us. It's not all just fun and games and kicking up our feet and just saying, okay, wife, now just do everything for me and I'm just going to be this lazy slob sitting on the couch and you're going to do all the work. That's not how it works because we have our own responsibilities. But in order to maintain, especially in, in today's society, I think it's important that the wife and children, when they speak to the, to the, to the husband and to the father, that they use respect. Now, when I, I have to catch myself every once in a while because I am in an environment in my work where I am very friendly with my boss. My boss is the owner of the company that I work for. I've worked there for quite a long time. We have a very good relationship work-wise, and I'm always trying to make sure that I am maintaining the proper level of respect and when he tells me to do something, I say, yes, sir, I do it and, and do whatever it is that is going to please him as being my boss because he's the one in charge and I am subordinate to him. We need to be able to take that mindset into the home. It doesn't mean it's, it's unloving. It doesn't mean you can't have endearment and, 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 and being close to each other. But there is a, a certain respect that is given when you can speak to the, the, your husband or your father in a way where you're giving them respect and the respect that is given to them from the Bible. That, that is the way that we ought to do that. And when it comes to all the considerations, even the small things, like I said, like, like serving food or something, you know, if... if the authority structure starts at the top. You know, if we were to have a, a banquet or a feast or something at my work, who do you think would deserve to get the first plate? The boss. The man in charge, right? I mean, it's such a little thing. You say, that's trivial, it's silly. But it's all a part of the culture of, of, of being right with God and being right in, in, in maintaining the proper attitudes that we ought to have based on the positions that we're in. The Bible says in Titus chapter 1, verse 6, If any be blameless, the husband of one wife, having faithful children, not accused of riot 
and unru or unruly. This is talking about a bishop or a pastor. One of the qualifications is that he needs to be a husband. He needs to have faithful children. So one of the jobs that's being looked at by the father is making sure that the children are raised and they're not accused of riot or unruly. They're not these, these little hellraiser kids that are going around and just always causing trouble and getting into fights and, and they're accused of, of being riotous, being unruly, not listening to people, not listening to adults, not listening to their parents. That the husband needs to be able to do that. And this is one of the qualifications to be a pastor. Also in 1 Timothy 3 verse 4, in regards to another section of scripture that talks about being a pastor, a husband is one that ruleth well his own house, having his children in subjection with all gravity. The godly family, the godly man, is one that can rule his own house. That's the word, 1 Timothy 3, 4. One that ruleth well his own house, having his children in subjection. It means that they know their place, that they are put in subjection with all gravity, seriousness. It's a gravity. It's this weight, you know, it's weight down that they know, hey, this is serious. Now, there's times when dad goofs around with the kids, and we know we can all play around. But then when it becomes serious, they need to know, okay, I'm going I, I to, I need to get in my place. And all throughout the scripture, you'll find this setup, this design within the family. Let's keep reading here. We're going to shift gears a little bit. Um, man, I have to keep catching myself. I want to say the Bible says, because I'm reading quotes from other people, and that's not the Bible at all. We're going back to the Bible to, to, to support why these assertions, or, or not assertions, these, uh, the things that were, that were happening in the 50s were correct and why they were biblical. Verse, uh, or, man, verse. It's not a verse. Quote, For dances and dates, the boy's father would often drive the boy... And after the girl was picked up, the couple to and from the event, but that was a pretty special concession by the dad. It's a pretty special thing for the dad to go out and do all this stuff. But what's also important to note here is that these children were chaperoned. They were not left alone. These kids were not allowed to just go off and, and, and boys and girls just getting in cars together and going to dances or whatever else. There was always an adult present, always to make sure because, why? Because you know that the flesh has a temptation for fornication, for doing things that they shouldn't be doing. And with a parent or adult present as a supervisor, you're eliminating that risk altogether. We have teenage, we have kids that are barely like going into puberty, which is at a much younger age now, having children. Kids in, in upper grade school and lower high school Getting pregnant and having children. Why? Because they have an occasion to the flesh. Because they're unmonitored. They're unsupervised. There's no parent, parents that, that don't care at all. I just let them go to these dances with these other genders at this age when they need to be supervised. They need to be monitored. They need to, to have at least somewhat of a leash on them to show that you are not going to be put in a, in a situation or occasion where, you know, let's say a boy, you know, it's nothing wrong with dating. You need to date in order to find someone to marry, right? Especially when you start getting to that age where you start dating. You know, parents, don't let those kids go into a room with a closed door, ever. Don't let it happen. You say, oh, but I trust my kid. Yeah. Just don't give occasion for the flesh. You trust them all you want, but <laughs> trust them with the door off the hinge. Right? <laughs> That's a much, much more wise way to do it. But it's the same way. Look, I trust my wife. I trust my wife completely. I have no doubts about her fidelity, about, about her loyalty and faithfulness to me. But you know what? I'm not going to allow her to just go off with some other man and just drive off together and go have lunch and do all these other things with someone that she's not related to. Why would I want to even allow for an occasion for a potential where she could start building this special relationship with someone other than her husband that could potentially even one day cause a wedge in our marriage. That's where it starts. It starts when you start getting these special relationships with people. It starts on the job. All these divorces and, and, and infidelity and adulteries happen because they start making friends with people of the opposite gender that blossoms and goes into other things. So the moment that you have a bad spot in your marriage, because they happen from time to time, it's for better or for worse, 
Except in my marriage, everything is roses every single day for the past seven and a half years. <laughs> but we're an exception. Well, I'm just kidding. There's, al there's always times where you have friction. You know, there's, there's times you have great happiness, but then when you go through those rough patches, you know, you don't want to have someone, the other guy or the other girl, to, to have them fall back to. And that will be way more destructive than everything. It's, it's prudency. It's, it's not giving occasion to the flesh. Let him that thinketh he stand to take heed lest he fall, the Bible says. You think you're so you're pure and holy and righteous. You start giving your, allowing yourself to be put in these different situations, you're going to fall. Greater men than you have done some pretty wicked sins in the Bible. I don't compare myself to someone like a King David or a Moses or these other great men in the Bible that have done so many wonderful things. They had great faith and accomplished so much for God. Yet when you look at some of their sins, when Moses murdered someone with his bare hands, David committed adultery and then murder, people have done some very wicked things of people who in their past had been very great people. It can happen, and we need to be vigilant to make sure that it doesn't happen, and especially with our kids. Kids don't have as much experience and grounding as they ought to, especially when they're going through a crazy time and they got all the hormones and everything else going on in their bodies that they're not used to. They're not always going to make the right decisions, and we need to make sure that we're protecting them from making a very detrimental decision. Shifting gears here is another statement. Corporal punishment of children was then seen as a very normal and desirable form of behavior modification, both at home and at school. Corporal punishment, what are we talking about? Spanking the kids. Back then, it says it was normal. Not only was it normal, it was desirable. Hey, that's the way we want to do it. That's the way we want to modify the behavior and correct what they're doing wrong is to use corporal punishment. Rarely did a parent challenge any punishment meted to their child at school. So when a kid was sent off to school and they got, they got disciplined at school, the parent didn't blame the teacher. They're going to be looking at their kids saying, what did you do? Why did you have to get this punishment? I mean, these days now people want to sue the teachers and like they have to wear, you know, gloves and, and, and can't even like touch a child at all and as soon as they do it's like this big deal and the parents are calling down and having you know and what is that you're, you're elevating the status of the child to being like an adult of being the one in charge and, and people now they can't do anything about it now I'm not for the public schools in general anyways but I mean we need to get our heads on straight children ought to be taught to respect adults and to respect their elders and to be able to have the respect for just for anybody so that look when an adult tells them something to do unless it's something that's weird or evil or, or sinful or something you listen to them and that's the way it was back then it says in fact as the as the chestnut went if you were punished at school you could expect double that punishment when you got home so if you if you even got caught being in trouble at school you, whatever punishment you got there you're getting twice as much at home. And that was acceptable and normal, and that's the way it was. It says, when Dr. Benjamin Spock in 1946 suggested that parents not spank their children, it was a radically new idea. And it should have been completely rejected. Unfortunately, some of the people have adopted that today. But the Bible, why, why do I say it should have been rejected? Turn, if you would, to Proverbs chapter 19. Proverbs chapter 19. Unfortunately, these days, people get very uncomfortable. It's an abnormal thing to be hearing a spanking or something like that going on when a child needs correction because we've been so sensitized into this, this concept of, oh, you can never do that to a child and how horrible it is. Look, why? Because you hear the child cry a little bit. Kids cry over everything. Kids cry over not getting a certain cereal. And they'll weep and wail and be like, oh, no, oh, like it's the worst thing that could happen to them. Just because a child screams their head off doesn't necessarily mean that they're injured, right? So when they get a swat on their behind, it stings. Yeah, and it, of course it's going to make them cry. Of course it is. It's not pleasant. But what people have to understand, especially those without children, is that you're not, I mean, unless you're just being full-on abusive and just, you know, winding up and just full...
strength, you know, whatever. Like, that's not what I'm talking about. And that's not what the Bible's talking about when it's talking about disciplining your child. You know, I don't just crack my six-year-old in the face and just, you know, clock her one. Obviously, that's abuse and immoral and just completely wrong and, and not what the Bible teaches. But there is a certain spot, a padded area of the body that God has designed for us to be able to receive instruction. Proverbs 19, verse 18 says, Chasten thy son while there is hope, and let not thy soul spare for his crying. So, oh, but that doesn't say anything about beating him with, uh, you know, spanking him or anything. Turn, if you would, to Proverbs 22. We're starting at Proverbs 19. Yes, we need to be able to chasten or correct or discipline our child when there is hope. It means when there's young, because they're going to get older. If you never discipline your child, when they start becoming a teenager and you've never disciplined them up to that point, you have no hope. It's too late. You need to start at a young age. You need to start with them early. And it says, And let not thy soul spare for his crying. And look, I'll be honest with you. Any par no parent likes to hear their children cry, especially like if they've gotten hurt or they have a little bit of pain. It is not something that's enjoyable for the parent. I do not, I'll honestly... I don't enjoy giving my children discipline. I don't enjoy hearing them cry. It's not like, oh, this is a great, oh, <laughs> all right, they screwed up. Now I get to go spank them. No, no, of course not. But I know that it's necessary. I know that it's needful. And, but you can't let the crying all of a sudden make you not want to do it. The Bible says don't spare for their crying. They're going to cry. You need to know about that. Don't let that hold back and withhold the correction from the child just because they're crying. Because you don't want to hear it, because it bothers you, whatever. You need to do it because they need it. Proverbs 22, verse 15 says, Foolishness is bound in the heart of a child. They're going to be foolish. It happens. It's bound in their heart. But the rod of correction shall drive it far from him. Talking about a rod, driving the foolishness out of the child, correcting them. But if, even if that's not enough for you to, to understand that the Bible is teaching corporal punishment, turn, if you would, to Proverbs 23. One chapter over. Because by this point, God can't get any more clear in Proverbs 23. If, if this doesn't do it, if this doesn't convince you, nothing will. Proverbs 23, verse 13. Withhold not correction from the child. For if thou beatest him with the rod, he shall not die. Thou shalt beat him with the rod and shalt deliver his soul from hell. I don't think you can get anywhere. Look, thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt beat him with the rod. <laughs> Okay, there's a lot of thou shalts in the Bible. This is one of them. And we can't spare for their crying. We need to be able to take the rod of correction, the rod of instruction, which is why we have our own little spanking stick at home. You know, everyone's got their own variety of it. But it's actually, there's, there's nothing wrong with it. And the reason why you want to use that is because, for one, you can inflict more sting with less, with less uh, force. Because it, like your hand will, is a lot more blunt force. You could be a lot. You could be. You could actually do more damage because you're not out to to inflict to to damage your child to injure your child. That is not the goal ever. No loving parent would ever want to injure their child. What you want to do is to be able to provide the the sting, the little bit of pain, that stinging sensation, which is not going to injure them at all, but it's going to correct them so that they understand. Hey, I don't want to do that again. Now, it goes deeper, as this verse says, and shall deliver his soul from hell. You say, well, I don't, want, I don't want to spank my child. He says, look, if you beat them with the rod, you're going to deliver their soul from hell. Why? Because you're going to instill in them from a young age, they're understanding that their consequences, their sins, when they break the rules, when they break your laws, there is a painful consequence associated with that, which is a greater understanding of, or a much smaller, but, but it, it foreshadows the, the actual truth of when you break God's laws, He has a punishment of hell associated with those things, which is very, very negative, which is 
very painful, which is torment and torture and pain. And see, too many kids these days are, are growing up with this concept of God not even being real and this concept of hell even being a real place being challenged. But if they're brought up knowing that, hey, when you do wrong, ooh, man, there's some pain. I don't like that. It'll make that much more sense to believe in a place called hell because God has a place designed for when you break His commandments, there is a, a very serious physical consequence to that. That's why I believe the Bible is saying, look, thou shalt beat him with the rod and shalt deliver his soul from hell. Bible teaches corporal punishment. It should be looked at as the standard and normal as it once was. Unfortunately, today, people want to call the cops on you for spanking your child not realizing the importance of it from God's Word. Now, formality. There's a lot of formality that we've lost these days. People used to actually learn manners. I'll read for you here. Teenage girls were often taught how to stand, sit, walk, talk, laugh, flatter a boy, and how to enter and exit a car in a gracious, feminine manner. This is something, this is, was a value. And this goes back to being feminine for the girls in a way that they didn't just act like a boy. They didn't just sit with their legs spread out like a, like a man would. They would fold their legs over. They would do all of these things because they were trying to be feminine. Because it was an important attribute, it was, it was, it was an important part of society to differentiate men, the way men act and the way women act. Schools maintain strict Inviolable dress codes then. A boy's hair was to be kept very short. Hair that touched the collar was thought to be unmanly and antisocial. Girls were made to wear dresses and skirts, usually puffed out by stiff crinolines. I don't even know what that is. Often forbidden to wear slacks. Again, and this goes more to the, to the gender role thing that I preached on a couple weeks ago, but the difference here is that Culturally, in society in the 1950s, there was a difference between the way men's hair was and the way that women's hair was. The, way, the dress and the things that, that, that girls wore and the, and, the, and the type of clothing that boys wore. And there was clear, forbidden, there were clear rules about what they could wear and what they could not wear. Teachers were treated with respect in the smaller town areas. And if a kid was more than mildly unruly. He or she was generally not considered nice and was not at all admired by his or her classmates. This is just promoting um, having manners and treating your know, kids treating adults with respect. The Bible says in Leviticus 19.32, you don't have to turn there, but something that we've lost these days as far as just treating people with respect and having uh, manners the Bible says, thou shalt rise up before the hoary head. Now, when it says that word hoary, it means like white. Okay, the old, when an old man, old woman comes into the room, he says, thou shalt rise up before the hoary head and honor the face of the old man and fear thy God, I am the Lord. The Bible teaches that, hey, if we're all sitting down here, we're having dinner or whatever, and an old man comes in the room, you stand up. You show your respect unto that man for just because of his age, because he is elder and that you respect your elders by just I'm going to stand up for him and that's the way things used to be and the Bible even teaches that that's not just some weird manner class that oh the culture just thought that that was the right thing to do that's what the Bible teaches here's another quote your boss was always referred to as Mr. blank right Mr. last name a female boss was a rarity never by his first name even when employees retired, they often address their former superior formally. Now, this has definitely changed today, and I was kind of talking about this earlier. I'm on a first-name basis with my boss. And with him, that's the way that he would prefer it. He does not want me calling him by his last name. He, he goes and introduces himself and goes away. But it's something that has changed in our culture. Now, I don't have a scripture for that. I don't, that's not, it's not like the Bible teaches you have to refer to people as Mr. or Mrs. whoever by their last name because that's not found. That's, that would be extra biblical to say that. But just the fact that people cared about showing respect unto others, that people had that type of an attitude, is a much better place to live in. Now, I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm kind of running out of time here. I'm going to go into some extended family here, a, little, a quote 
about extended family. The 1950s marked the first time in human history in which extended families no longer lived together under one roof. Now, I would question the uh, accuracy of that statement, but that was a statement nonetheless. The rise of Levitt towns, cookie-cutter suburban residential areas proliferated at that time, and the idea of the nuclear family was born. A house containing one heterosexual couple and their kids only, with no grandparents or aunts and uncles necessarily living there too. Whether this nuclear family concept has enriched or impoverished a child's growing up or a couple's marriage remains debatable. Now, turn if you would to Mark chapter 10. See, I don't think that this was just all of a sudden this brand new idea that never ever happened before in history and that it was only done for the first time in the 1950s in America. I don't buy that. Now, there is something to be said for the, the economic prosperity in general of, of people and, and family having to, to reside within the same quarters because it's just made sense financially that people didn't have enough money to be able to go out and have all of their own places. I get that. But I don't think that this was the only time that this has ever happened and this was some brand new phenomenon ever to take place. The Bible says in Mark chapter 10, verse number 6, Jesus Christ speaking, But from the beginning of the creation God made them male and female. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife. And they twain shall be one flesh, so then they are no more twain but one flesh. What therefore God hath joined together, let not man put asunder. The, Bi the Bible's teaching all the way back from Genesis and Jesus Christ reiterating it that's saying, look, God made people male and female and the reason why you leave your father and mother, you don't stay within the same dwelling place, you leave your father and mother and you cleave to your wife and you start a new family with them. This is a concept that was given to us from Scripture all the way back to Genesis with the husband and wife being created. Another quote, several generations living in a single home was far more common and not viewed as unusual unless an elderly relative was very ill. They remained in the home, especially in cities and rural areas, until they died. Now, I'm not doubting the truthfulness of that statement of saying, yeah, the worst people, that, that family that stuck together and would live together. And um, that's not bad either. See, the Bible teaches that we ought to be able to take care of our family, not only to provide for them, but to take care for them, especially when they become older and in need. And this is something that our culture has gotten away from. And people become so busy that now they want to put their parents into a home and just have someone else take care of it or, or, the, or the let whatever happen. I think the Christian thing to do is to, when your parents get to that point, when they need somebody, that you have that, you invite them in your house and you take care of them just as they took care of you when you were a young child and you take care of them. Turn, if you would, to Mark chapter 7. I believe this is what Jesus is talking about in Mark chapter 7, and I believe this is part of the commandment to honor your father and mother. I don't think that honoring your father and mother, I preached this just recently, is just talking about having a respect where you talk to them respectfully. I think there's way more to it than just that. That word honor is not just used for giving like verbal respect to, but it's also used, and I proved this before, and I think it was last week's sermon, that honor is also can have to do with financially taking care of people. When the Bible talks about honor widows that are widows indeed in the church, for the church to be able to have to honor widows, it's not just showing them respect. It's actually taking care of them because their provider is gone. That's the church's job and function to take care of widows who are widows indeed, who meet the qualifications of a scriptural widow that needs to be taken care of, that they have no means of taking care of themselves. The tithes and the offerings are, are brought into church to take care of those people. But look at Mark 7 verse 9. Just further proof that honor isn't just talking about respect. Verse 9, And he said unto them, Full well ye reject the commandment of God, that ye may keep your own tradition. For Moses said, Honor thy father and thy mother, and whoso curseth father and mother, let him die the death. So he's referring to the commandment of honor thy father and mother, and he's saying you reject that commandment of God through their traditions. And what was their tradition? Verse 11. But ye say, so instead of, they, instead of God's commandment, they said, if a man shall say to his father or mother, it is Corban, 
That is to say, a gift by whatsoever thy, thou mightest be profited by me, he shall be free. So they were saying, well, whatever I give you, mom and dad, you could just thank your lucky stars that I gave that to you and you could just consider that a gift as if it's not, they weren't obligated to take care of them. He just says, you just consider that a gift. And it frees the person, the, the, the son, from, from his commandment of honoring the father and mother. It says, And ye suffer him no more to do aught, to do anything for his father or his mother, making the word of God of none effect through your tradition which ye have delivered, and many such like things do ye. So you're saying that, that commandment, you've just made it of none effect. The commandment to honor your father and mother, it's like it doesn't even exist if you're just saying all you have to do is you don't even have to give them a gift, but if you decide to do something to help them, then they could consider that a gift. And you know how I, who I've heard espouse that same exact mentality is Dave Ramsey. I used to listen to his radio show, and I've heard him tell other people, you don't have to take care of your parents. You just let them know, hey, you're the one in charge, and now you're the one. If they're coming to you for any money, you don't have to give them anything, but they could just be thankful for whatever they get from you. He's made the commandment of God of none effect. Because the Bible teaches to honor your father and mother. It's not just talking about respect. It's saying you need to take care of them. When my parents get old, if they need help, if they start getting Alzheimer's, if they start getting other diseases or other problems and they're unable to take care of themselves, guess what? I'll take them into my house. I'll take care of them because that's the right thing to do. That's what the Bible teaches to do. To honor your father and mother. And no one can care for your family the way that your family can care for them. So unless there's actually some really bad sickness or disease where I just physically cannot take care of them and I need like professional help somehow to do that, I'm going to take care of them. Too many people are being put into homes. And I've seen these homes. I've seen my, my grandparents be put in these homes. And who knows what the worker is like. Some of them may be well-intentioned, but they're never going to care for the people as they'd care for their own family. Which is why I will never put my parents at home unless it's absolutely 100% completely necessary, completely out of my control to be able to, to help them at all. I will do everything in my power to get them to be cared for at my house with me because I think that's the scriptural thing to do. All right, I'm going to skip that. One last point, because I can't pass this up. I've got some other things I'm passing up. There's a section on tattoos where basically it was like nobody got tattoos unless you were like a sailor or something. That was the way it was looked on. In today's society, everybody's getting tattoos and it's fine and it's normal and, and you put them everywhere. The Bible says you shall not make any cuttings in your flesh for the dead, nor print any marks upon you. I am the Lord. The Bible's against tattoos, but that's not the one I wanted to get to. I just wanted to mention that because there's another point I had. Here's a quote back from the 50s. Young people who admitted being gay were seen as being an obscene shame to the family and some gay youth were sent to sanitariums for shock treatments, hormone and aversive therapies. Most gay men and women in those days would eventually marry heterosexually whether for social disguise or from the desperate hope that it might straighten them out. Media figures like movie and TV stars who were gay would masquerade as straight and their film studios would stage highly visible heterosexual dates as press photo opportunities. The mere whiff that a star might be homosexual could spell instant death to his, his or her career. That's the way it was viewed in the 50s as a really bad, abnormal, obscene thing for someone to be a homo. And that it could kill the career. Think about that. Think about Holly Weird today and the, that, the fact that their career might just go completely down the tubes and nobody would want to have anything to do with them. No one would want to watch them because it came out that they're a homo. That's the way the 1950s were. And that's why they enjoyed so much more safety in their neighborhoods. Because they didn't exalt the vile weirdos and the pedophiles that are rampant. And look, I'll say this so I'm blue in the face. I don't care. The, the, the homosexuals that are out there, they recruit, they prey on people, and they prey on the young kids. Right. 
Whether you want to believe that or not, it's the truth. They're weird, they're perverted, they're demented, and they, they prey on the children. And they try to recruit them into their lifestyles, as they like to call it. It says here, gay was either criminal or so disgusting that there was no sympathy or safety, whatever, if one was beaten, killed, or abused by the law or anyone else. Also, the term of choice was queer or queen. I never heard the word gay. And I want to get that word gay out of our vernacular. Because gay is actually a Bible word. Gay means happy. And I don't want to refer to some reprobate sodomite as just being happy. Because that is not descriptive of who they are. Romans chapter 1 describes the sodomite. Romans chapter 1, I'll just read briefly for you the attributes of someone who is reprobate and rejected by God. Sorry, in verse 26, who for this cause God gave them up unto vile affections for even their women to change the natural use into that which is against nature. And likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust one toward another, men with men working that which is unseemly and receiving in themselves that recompense of their error which was meet. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. Those things of being a perverted sodomite. The reason why they became that way is because God gave them over to that reprobate mind because they rejected God. They were God-hating, God-rejecting people that didn't want to have anything to do with salvation and they were turned over to this reprobate mind. Here's the attributes. Verse 29, being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, implacable, unmerciful. That is not gay. There's nothing happy about any of those attributes. They are twisted and perverted. So we shouldn't be referring to them as gay. That's lightening the, the, the sinfulness of what they're doing. In Jude, verse 7, the Bible says, Even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh. See, in the 50s they used the right word, queer. Because that word queer means strange. And the Bible says they go after strange flesh are set forth for an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. The men of Sodom and Gomorrah, they went after strange flesh. They were queer. That was the right word to be using. James 2 verse 3 says, And ye have respect to him that weareth the gay clothing. It has nothing to do with homosexuality. The Bible word talking about a man's clothing being gay, meaning, meaning you know, um, bride or happy or you know whatever and say unto him sit thou here in a good place and say to the poor stand thou there or sit here under my footstool gays have nothing to do with being a sodomite and that was definitely something they had right in the 50s but I'm going to close it with that let's bow our eyes have a word of prayer dear heavenly God, father lord we thank you so much for your words God I pray that you would please help us to have a movement of people that love you and care about you and, and the, the values and the standards that you hold for us today, dear Lord. Help us to, to hate the wicked, filthy, sinful um, activities that are going on today, dear Lord, and help us to call them what they are and to not tolerate them, dear Lord, as they weren't tolerated in the past in this country. God, I pray that you please help us to hold ourselves to a higher standard, that you would teach us what that standard is. Dear Lord, help us to be more masculine or more feminine based on whether or not we're a man or a woman, dear God, and that we would embrace the roles that you've given us, dear Lord, in this society and, and um, according to your words and not let this society dictate uh, how we ought to behave and how we ought to act, dear Lord, but that we could remain true to your words. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.